The following podcast is a presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Welcome back to the Horror Academic and a special episode. Not only are we talking about a really, really important movie this week, this month, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but we have a guest. And our guest via Skype is author C.P. Hunt, who is also the head of Grindhouse Press. C.P., if you want to say hi. Hello. Thanks for having me on. Oh, no, definitely. Um, C.P.'s the author of some really great books. Um, I highly recommend. I just finished reading Halloween Fiend this week, and I loved it. Um, how would you describe your work? Um, it kind of varies. Uh, I can write everything from, like, splatterpunk and extreme all the way to quiet horror. Um, but everything that I do, I prefer uh, to write everything in first person. Um, I like to use the psyche of the character in order to kind of take you through the story. So... Yeah, that's a an interesting twist. Once you realize you're going to spend the entire story that way, it's 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 kind of fun when you feel how things are going. So mm-hmm. I like that a lot. Um, so, as an author who writes horror mostly, um, what is your favorite kind of horror films? Um, it varies. I actually kind of like um, well, I like the old Grindhouse films for sure, um, but I also like things that are more psychological and kind of quiet too. Um, for me, it's always the, when it comes to your quote unquote monsters, uh, if the more believable and plausible that they are, I feel like that's more frightening. Something like, uh, Hannibal Lecter would be more frightening to me than something say like Pumpkinhead. Uh, I appreciate both of them, but like, I will go towards more like the, the psychological horror stuff too. And, uh, so I gave you the option to pick what movie we would talk about. So what made you pick Texas Chainsaw? Um, it is probably for me the most, like when it comes to like grindhouse films, I think it's just like perfect. It, uh, I was actually, when I watched it again last night, uh, I was watching it with somebody and they said, you know, if this was released today, I wonder if it would be labeled as an art house film. And I had to really think about it. I was like, yeah, I think it would be, I think it would be. Yeah. uh, A couple years back, there was a 4k release that came out and it, it hit a couple of the art house theaters actually and I my husband and I went to see it for Halloween and seeing it in a theater when it's strange enough for somebody who grew up in like the VHS era to see it so crisp and clean Mm -hmm. but um you realize how abstract the film gets at times and how unnerving and how they do that through abstraction which is not a common thing in horror movies up until that point yeah yeah um we actually got a chance to see it a couple years ago at the drive-in and that was a completely different experience yeah, um, we have a local drive-in that um, during the month of October, they would show, I believe it was Friday and Saturday nights, they would show double and sometimes triple features of old horror films, and that happened to be one of them, yeah. That's a pretty nice lineup, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, let's talk a little bit about the history of Texas Chainsaw. So, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, 1974, directed by Toby Hooper, written by Toby Hooper with Kim Henkel. Mm-hmm. Um before Texas Chainsaw, the pair had made the film Eggshells. Um, do you know anything about Eggshells? I've seen I actually it. have not seen Eggshells. Yeah. Uh, I, that was I've seen that in you know in reading up on it, and I actually listened to the book that uh, Gunnar Hansen had written about yeah. the the making of the movie, and he had brought up Eggshells, and I'm like, I don't think I've ever seen that. I, I had just read um, that Arrow uh, Entertainment put out a a newer Blu-ray set for, I believe it was Chainsaw 2, and they included it as a, an extra, so I'm going to have to look oh, that up. Yeah. But it's, um, that is actually, when you look up Eggshells, it's classified, it's not a horror film, it's classified as like a head film. It's um, it's mm. a psychedelic film. So this is experimental uh, filmmaking. Okay. And that's kind of where they're rooted in. So that's, I think, why we get such um, odd, strange mixes of things in Texas Chainsaw that you wouldn't normally see in a horror film. Yeah. So I think that's a really cool... Um, building block you know 
it's something yeah. to start with. Um, one of the other things is, of course, the story of why they wrote the story of Leatherface in Texas Chainsaw. And um, Toby Hooper tells the story about kind of uh, when he grew up, uh, Ed Gein was um, kind of like a tale that they would tell kids to get them to go to bed and brush their teeth and clean their rooms and stuff like that. And uh, so Ed Gein has an influence, but he never actually researched him when he wrote uh, the story. So it was kind of just going on what he thought Ed Gein was, which was kind of interesting, too. <laughs> the, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a weird way to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so we still see like things that you hear from the Ed Gein story. There's uh, bones used uh, to make objects in the house. There's the, the mask, the skin mask and stuff like that. But he guessed which is cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at least it wasn't a complete knockoff. So people who are into true crime couldn't be like, Oh, well that's just completely taken from this. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's, it, there's a movie. Um, Do you ever see the movie deranged? Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's been a few years ago, but yeah, I, I have watched that. That That's probably a little closer to the Ed Gein story actually. And I think it came out a little before this. If I'm not, I haven't seen that in a long time either. <laughs> yeah. It's been, it's been a while. <laughs> yeah. But that was one of the first movies Tom Savini worked on. So I think that's why a lot of people know Deranged. Um, but it's a, it's um, kind of they steal the story, but they don't use the names. Uh, mm. um, so he takes this kind of inkling of this, what this boogeyman kind of monster was in his life. And he wrote the story of Texas Chainsaw. And they, they kind of also um, emphasized to make it something that was filmable on a budget that they had. Um, using uh, actors who were students and... Um, a lot of people actually write from the film schools in Austin, crewed the film for them too, which was interesting. Um, the I think the first thing that's a, like an important thing about uh, Texas Chainsaw is it introduces the character of Leatherface, who becomes iconic, right? I mean, I I, I kind of shy away from putting him in on, on a scale of like Freddy, Jason, Leather, you know, like those kind of yeah. It's it. I'm not. I'm not sure how I feel about all that, but uh, <laughs> uh, what. Think about like what was your kind of takeaway maybe the first time you saw the film about Leatherface? Um, yeah, when yeah, when you say like an iconic figure, to me it was it seems like uh, I have to think of this correctly. Yeah, um, so all the other iconic uh, horror um, you know monsters or whatever all seem to have like quote unquote magical powers. Yeah. To where Leatherface does not. He is just a human being with a mask on that does terrible things, and you know, and, and, and surrounded by a family that does terrible things also. But um, yeah, when it comes to like your other horror movie icons, there always seems to be some kind of supernatural element to that person. You can't kill them. You can't, you know, you, uh, there's only certain ways to defeat them or fight back against them. To where Leatherface is just a human being. So I think that's that that's the thing that really stuck out to me. Oh, definitely. I mean, also, if you, I guess in later sequels, they might have messed with that a little bit. To a little, the, yeah. <laughs> he kind of gets a little Jason-esque at some point where he just keeps coming back to life and you're like, well, oh, does that happen? But yeah, I think if we just think about the first movie, yeah, it, there's nothing supernatural at all. This is just a messed up family. Um, mm -hmm. And they this kind of cannibalistic uh, to a, a further extreme to almost an art form. Um, yeah. The... Uh, I guess the other thing that's that's interesting about that is um, we, I guess before that, you think of, yeah, even the, the universal monsters are all these kind of supernatural creatures. They're not, they're not people in any way, except mm -hmm. for like, I guess we could kind of almost say the wolf man until uh, he becomes, uh, you know, the wolf. Yeah. But <laughs> um, so even looking back before we see the films that came after it, it doesn't, um, it doesn't match the mold of what a horror film was at the time. Oh, yeah. Um, another thing is that it's kind of toted as one of the films that I won't say it is a slasher, but led to the slasher subgenre. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's kind of your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to recall anything that came about. Uh, um, I think like that was always the shocking thing about that film was, uh, when it first came out that warning at the beginning yeah. saying you know this was based on true events which it's not right. you know so i think that kind of like really I, almost like that true crime thing there's such a huge following uh, of people like myself included i listen to a lot of true crime podcasts i read the books i watch documentaries and stuff on them because again i'm fascinated with the actual psyche behind 
what is going on instead of like the supernatural elements of it. But I think like, yeah, that might have driven like that type of story. Cause like before that you didn't see like a ton of that in the mainstream, I guess. Um, I mean, there were gory films and stuff, yeah. but it's just like, that one just seems so much more intense. Uh, I, and I think it has to do with like, yeah, almost like those arty shots the up close, the cutting away, the up close, the cutting, just like building suspense there towards the end of just like, you know, it's the people, it's her, it's the people, it's her, you know, back and forth. And like her reaction was so great. And like you said, you know, these were actors that came from like school, which is so risky. You know, it's like, I've watched a lot of shot on video stuff. Um, and it's just like, I can't recall the name of the film offhand, but there's been films that I've watched that it's like the practical effects are fantastic, but the, the people <laughs> acting in them not so great. And you're just like, oh, this could have been such a really great film had they had actors that were a little bit more experienced or maybe a director that could work with the actors to kind of find their weaknesses and stuff. Um, and this just all kind of falls together. Um, but yeah, I think it did kind of spur like, oh my God, this is so crazy. And I think that reaction came from I don't know, people misinterpreting that it was real. So I think that might have spurred like a whole set of new directors to be like, you know, let's do more, let's do gory or let's do more blood, let's do more crazy stuff that people are just gonna be like, oh my God, what am I watching? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, even if you think about other like gory films that had come out before this, like if you think of H.G. Lewis's stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you compare like Blood Feast, mm -hmm. which is one of his best movies. Yeah. More fun over the top to Texas Chainsaw, it's like night and day. Yeah. Because you walk out of Blood Feast laughing. And yeah. it's like a joke with you. Yeah. You walk out of Texas Chainsaw kind of afraid of humanity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, true. Uh, that, that was the name that was slipping by me. I was like, oh, that, who is like, yeah, yeah, H is like, there's a lot of, you know, gore in that. But it's, it's almost like, I don't want to say camp, but oh, yeah. it, it, it feels like, you know, when you have directors that, uh, you know, because they've been watching movies their entire lives. And with him, he was a little older and stuff. So I feel like he came from like the universal school, like watching maybe those universal films and stuff yeah. like that. So it's just like trying to take that and go more. And then something like Toby Hooper would be playing off of someone like him and yeah. trying to be like, how can I make this even more intense type thing? Yeah. And another thing that, that Toby Hooper talked about um, in he, I don't think he looked at it as intensity, but as in realism in the film, mm -hmm. was that his background, um, he talked about in some interviews that he, you know, he was a college professor. He at one point had wanted to maybe be a doctor. So he thought about it really realistically. Like mm -hmm. the reason why, you know, when we first see Leatherface and he, you know, puts the hammer to Kirk and Kirk goes down and he starts yeah. his legs go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's like, well, well, if you hit somebody in the head hard enough, the brain frag, you know, the skull fragments are going to hit the brain and the brain's going to do this. So he's like mm -hmm. doing the math like, of yeah. how this would really happen. And I think people weren't ready for that, you know, mm -hmm. like for it to be real looking. And mm -hmm. that's frightening. Um, uh, and he did, he kind of ramps up the intensity as it goes. And that first encounter, even the first time you see Leatherface is from this low angle shot looking yeah. right up at him and he's just towering. Gunner was a huge guy. Yeah. So um, he's just horrifying. And then uh, an extra layer is that uh, most of the actors were fairly method in their form of acting. And um, Toby and uh, Kim Hankel and the crew had kind of separated um, Gunnar Hansen from the teenagers so mm -hmm. that they didn't see him until they saw him in the film. Yeah. So yeah. that was just like even more intense for them. It felt like they were really in that moment. So playing with those kind of things it, it, it feels to almost like he's he's building a puzzle you know and, and he's messing with us with messing with our brains in yeah, the way yeah. we, we process what we're looking at you know um, yeah i i had read about the the separating thing and i thought that's probably kind of genius especially when you have actors who you know are kind of green and it's just like yeah let's just keep the this guy to the side and they're not going to see him they're not going to see how tall he is they're not going to see the mask that he's wearing or anything until he shows up in the scene that they're in and it's just like yeah so they get almost like a natural reaction <laughs> to the guy and um uh I, I was lucky enough years ago to get to interview Gunnar Hansen and he talks about how 
because it's such a low budget for the film, they only had the one costume and they were really terrified of washing it in any way or sending it out mm-hmm. to get laundered because they want, didn't want anything to get lost. Yeah. So he was wearing the same outfit the entire time. <laughs> it's over 100 degrees for 30 days in that clothes. Oh, my God. He, he was pretty terrified of himself, you know, yeah. going through that experience. So just imagine what it was like for the kids to be in that room with this towering, smelly guy. You know? <laughs> And it's an extra level of fear, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. But um, there is, I think, uh, so many things that they do that make the film very realistic in nature. And um, to me, another thing that's very important is the sound design in the yes. film. Yes, yeah, yeah. I think the sound design is excellent on that. It is so, um, uh, you know, there's like noise bands who kind of just use everyday items to make certain noises, but they done it in such a like a low grade kind of way that it's just like a almost like a looming doom, you yeah. know, kind of sound going on in the background very, very faintly. Like it's not something that overpowers any of the dialogue or any of the action that's happening. Like you're getting full fledged screaming from Marilyn Burns, you're getting full fledged <laughs> chainsaw from Gunnar Hansen. And it's just like, usually in movies, it seems like there's always this crescendo of music coming up to swell over top of all that. And they did not do that at all. And there's like this um, low uh, kind of uh, rumbling, uh, yes. kind of droning noises throughout it that already mm-hmm. kind of set you off. Plus the heat, you can see the heat in, in the film. Yeah, Those two elements together, I think are very effective. Oh, and yeah. Even if you think of the very first sequence we see for the titles is the um, the the snapshots. Yes. Yeah. And that sound of that flash bulb is mm-hmm. just so graining, you know, to yeah. start set you off um, before the movie even goes anywhere. <laughs> yeah. So. And it's like and it's such an iconic so- uh, sound too because yeah. I always my dad was a huge fan of like the movie The Shining. And oh, yeah. he would watch it several times a year. And I would like, I remember being upstairs and like, I would hear that dun, dun, dun. I was like, dad's watching The Shining again. Yeah. But like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, as soon as you hear that high pitched key and you're just like, oh, somebody's watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yep. Yep. I mean, I, um, I, I'm a Marilyn Manson fan from way back. And uh, that's using that, that flash bulb noise in his mm-hmm. cover of I Put a Spell on You is just, yeah. so, I love that. Yeah. But yeah, so much. And then even when they're in the van and the teens are listening to the radio, mm-hmm. uh, it's just like happy-go-lucky little, yeah. you know, like a little ditty going on. And at, and at the same time, at this point, they have the hitchhiker in the van with them and he's cutting himself to this sound. And just, yeah, it, it plays with your brain, you know? Yeah. And it's so weird that like uh, a lot of movies during that time used such like, like, happy music in the yeah. beginnings like I always think of like the last house last on the house. left yep. and I don't know if there's a little known um oh gosh I always get them I think it's mutilator or maybe pieces where they play like this really upbeat like almost like circus music at the beginning of the movie you're just like I don't know what it must have just have been a thing like in the 70s and 80s to kind of like really mess with people it's just like I'm gonna give you this music that's such a weird juxtaposition to like what the movie is uh, it's always I always find it kind of like comical when that kind of music's playing in the background. <laughs> and I think it, I think it, in this effect, it also it, it is kind of like a little bit of relief, almost mm-hmm. like yeah. Oh, it's okay. You know, things will be all right. <laughs> Listen to how good this, you know the music is telling you it's going to yeah. be fine. And it's you know it's it's completely just um, trying to do the opposite. It, it's mm-hmm. a, it's a perfect juxtaposition of the scene. Yeah. yeah. Um, along the si- along lines of sound design is uh, set dressing. Mm-hmm. and set design in general in this film uh one of the things that um the uh the prop master for the movie uh talked about was treating the house that the family lived in as if mm-hmm. it was a character and yeah. um we see you know rooms full of nothing but furniture made from bones and chickens and wire cages and feathers everywhere and just you know thrown around buckets of uh, teeth you know yeah and Nothing could kind of disarm you more, you know, in a movie, yeah. seeing a room like that. Yeah. And, and um, I noticed, too, it's like, I, I feel like, you know, I've seen the movie so many times. I'm like, well, I'm going to watch it again. I watched it last night uh, thinking, well, I'm not going to see anything new. And right. I totally caught something new yeah. when uh, the scene where he um, puts the, I can't think of her name, puts her on the hook. 
mm-hmm. you know, and there's the deep freezer there. Yep. I did not realize this because I watched this movie called Las Vegas Bloodbath. And there's a scene where it's like so obvious there's like paper on the wall. Yeah. Because there's a gory scene in there and blood stuff gets all over the wall. And I'm just like, it's so obvious. Like you could see the paper, you can hear the crinkling as people are like, you know, and um, yeah, during that scene, I didn't realize that there is brown paper on the wall to kind of protect it. Cause I knew they were using somebody's house. Yeah. It's definitely somebody's real house. Yeah. I wonder what that house was like when they gave it back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it also, it's kind of effective though. And almost making it look like a book, like a, a butcher's kind of shop. Yeah, like butcher paper. Yeah. 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 And so it's like, I don't know why I never noticed that before, but I yeah. was just like, Oh, they totally, yeah. We're protecting the walls. They were using like brown paper, but it, it actually, cause it was like um almost like paper sack so it was like brown and aged and yeah and they had painted and stuff on it to make it even look grosser so it looked like it was part of the house but oh, it was yeah. one of those things that uh, just totally passed me a hundred times and i'm like wait a minute that they were protecting the house there and i guess i just never realized that before <laughs> yeah even even the uh the one upstairs room you see when marilyn burns runs upstairs to try and find um someone to kind of i guess someplace at least to hide maybe from Leatherface. Yeah. Um, that's when you find, you know, grandpa and grandma, grandma in that one yeah. room. Yeah. And uh, like the taxidermy, I think, I think I've saw the movie many times before I realized the other taxidermy in the room besides them, you know, it's like, oh, yeah. was, it's like the family dog right there, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but even just like the, the hanging, you know, kind of uh, uh, the hanging bulb without mm-hmm. any kind of uh, cover to it is uh, just, it it's kind of hits you as off and wrong. Oh, yeah, you know? yeah. But, uh, and that's a, a fun sequence that I think they play with um, when they, Texas Chainsaw 2 was made, kind of mm-hmm. reliving that kind of space where grandma yeah. lives. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, see, I, I remember the first time I watched the film, uh, I was, you know, very worried about seeing, you know, Leatherface. I thought that would scare the hell out of me. But it was Grandpa. When oh, they yeah. cut her finger and mm-hmm. he sucks the blood and he comes back to life and he's just like a little baby. And yeah, he's like blood. kicking and kind of like, yeah, I remember <laughs> like the little hand movements. And, <laughs> yes, yes. and he just, he, I, I, and I was watching it again this week also and just to see his feet kick like a baby too. I yeah. was just like, uh, <laughs> brought me right back to my nightmares as a teenager. <laughs> but, uh, and and um, Jim Dugan, who played uh, Grandpa, was actually a teenager. And yeah. I, I love the fact that they got him to do it because they could put the layers of makeup on him. Mm-hmm. And he was, he was like, whatever, sure. <laughs> and I but, always feel like he probably got it the worst as far as like, it was so hot. And then yeah. his full, like even with leather face, there was at least the mouth and stuff. And there was able to breathe. I mean, like that was probably put on with spirit gum, yes. like that guy's mask and it covers his whole entire head. So it's just like, yeah, I cannot imagine what it was like inside of there. Actually, it was so bad that he told them when they put it on, he's like, that's it. I'm never doing this again. Shoot everything you want with me today. Oh, wow. And, and that's one of the reasons why the dinner sequence uh, took almost like, I was going to say 20 hours, but it was it was a massive amount of time. Yeah. Just, like, almost an entire day and they're filming that. Yeah, I remember that the the yeah, the dinner sequence took a really long time. And I just remember that even the end sequence um, and the, the book that I listened to, they had to call Marilyn back. Yes. Like she had got done. She had cleaned no. off, cleaned up, gotten everything off of her. Was finally like ready to crash in bed. And she said, "I think as soon as she laid down, or shortly after, they called her and they're like, yeah, we need you to come back in.'" <laughs> yeah, the very last part where she jumps out the window, I think, is yeah. what we didn't get. Yeah. But even um, starting from that scene uh, where they're trying to get Grandpa to be the one to to, to get her, right? Mm-hmm. To be the one to to hit her with the hammer, and he can't do it. And yeah. Gunner. Uh, talks about in several interviews he talks about the fact that um he it was so hot in there it was like cooking his brain he felt and he started yeah. to just kind of get into it and oh, yeah. he was trying to help him hurt her at some point he was just like we have to kill her yes yeah so like over 100 degrees hours and hours and hours the 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 classic part of the story is that they were in that room so long they had to keep changing out the head cheese on the table because it kept rotting oh, God. <laughs> It was, and then because they were shooting all day long, they had to black out the windows. Oh, so they yeah. added even like another layer of the heat and then the lights and just, oh. but just that's how intense and knowing how like a movie made with literally blood, sweat and tears like that. Yeah. I think that's even more so a 
why this film is so extremely effective and B, yeah. you don't make movies like this anymore. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It's like, I'm always really impressed. Like, 30 days, you know, is, is like, nothing. Like, yes. 30 days for an entire film, it's like everybody has to be there 100%. Uh, the, and and just be like, I just got to block out a month where I can't do anything except for yeah. live this film. And it's just like, that's always really, really impressive when people can film. Because there are some small budget or low budget uh, films that are just like, yeah, we filmed this in like 10 days or something. Right. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Uh, yeah. The uh, I, I mean, I guess, and that was knowing that they were going to use students on, mm -hmm. in the film, that that was why they shot in the summer. Yeah. In Texas, shooting in the summer is something totally different than anything I think we we would experience where we live, right? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. I can't. I can't imagine. It's like um, there's a convention that's in Austin, and it's usually in August. And I think, oh God, <laughs> I can't imagine how hot it is in Texas in August. Uh, I used to live one place that my neighbors um, they um, lived in Texas throughout the year, but they actually came to Ohio during the summer months because Texas was too hot for them. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's like killer cons in August, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, uh, I don't know if I could. August, yeah, I, I I don't know if I could survive just going to that con. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we talked about sound design and set dressing. Um, we definitely talked about the influence that Leatherface. Well, let, let's talk a little bit more about Leatherface as a character. Okay. Um, uh, how do you think? having a character like Leatherface, how, like you said, he's not supernatural. He is a person who does bad things. Mm -hmm. How do you think that influenced film after it? Oh, um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think that, um, there's a lot of things that come from that. I mean, obviously books too. Um, but yeah, that there are things like, you know, si like I said, silence of the lamb and stuff like that. But there's like, I think even so much of like, uh, comic characters like the Joker like the Joker is just like a sociopath you know I think people just realize it's like oh some of the scariest things that you can put on film or in a book or in a comic or anywhere are people that are kind of plausible I yeah. think um, yeah th there seems to be more of that uh, nowadays I would say um, yeah. but like yeah I think Texas Chainsaw Massacre could have, especially in the horror industry, because there's also like psychological thrillers and stuff like that, um, that aren't really based in horror that kind of use that same concept. Um, I don't want to say that it's like an easy concept, um, but I, I, per I enjoy it, you know, because it's just like, oh, I see what's going on here. I watched a film recently. Um, it was a newer art house film where you're watching it and this girl is doing these very, very terrible things. And you're just like, oh, you know, most people would kind of look at them and be like, what is going on? Why is this happening? But like, if you're kind of into that kind of thing, you say, oh, there's some kind of underlying mental illness here causing this woman to murder these people. And you're just like, um, yeah. So I think there is like a, a, like a wide influence to be like, yeah, we can, it, with Leatherface, it was very visual. You know, you knew that there was something wrong when you saw him, when you saw that mask. Um, the fact that he's not, he doesn't communicate I think even adds a layer to that because you can't reason with him. Um, so it's just like, yeah, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people kind of move forward to where they're just like, well, make the person look completely normal, yeah. but have them be like this crazy person, this bloodlust uh, that ha that they have on their mind. Um, and I think, yeah, I see like a lot of stuff like that. And it's just more than the horror. I think, yeah, like I said, thrillers and, and mysteries and stuff go, go that far too. Yeah, I definitely, um, and then another thing that, and this is maybe something uh, of Gunnar Hansen that he's bringing to the, the role that I don't know if someone else had done or if it's something that comes from Toby Hooper or Kim Henkel and all, but there's almost moments where you feel bad for Leatherface, if this makes any sense, uh, where he's he has emotions. He has, mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's moments where you get to see him kind of panicked and worried and uh you know he's afraid of his older brothers and he you know like yeah it's kind of family dynamic which mm -hmm. is obviously um he's he's uh, a bit childlike in nature mm -hmm. as well so he, we know he's awful and he's got these horrible things he does but at the same time he emotes emotions right? yeah yeah, because there's uh like the part where the dinner scene before the dinner scene it's like um the cook I always call him the cook. Yep. Uh, he's 
you cook and the hitchhiker and grandpa, yep. you know. Uh, so the cook is yelling at him to get back in the kitchen. He's just, oh, like <laughs> running into the kitchen. And then I think it's after the first two kills where he goes into the room and he's like looking yes. out the window and he's, you know, and he sits down and he's like looking around, like contemplating, like, what do I do? What do I do? You know, and it's just like he is able that's got that's a really hard one for a character who can't communicate yes. to communicate emotion. So, yeah. And you do kind of feel sorry for him. You're just like, well, I mean, he was, you know, he's he was made, you know, he was made by this family mm-hmm. and treated in such a way that he is who he is because of them. Like yeah. it's you know it could nature versus nurture you know type thing so it's, it's definitely like a, a family illness of sorts that's going on <laughs> um uh, yeah the, the the scene that comes to me is when um the cook comes home uh and and he just he's like beating on leatherface like what what are you yeah. doing what, how did you let these kids get away you know and it's it's yeah. like it's all on him and he's yeah he's cowering in fear mm-hmm. um but then at the same time when he uh is also when we realize when he prepares dinner, gets dinner ready at the table. Leatherface changes his mask to the yeah. woman mask. So it's like, mask. Yeah. <laughs> like, so he's got these different, you know, I'm, I'm emoting, you know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> he's got his moments. Um, uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about the other two characters, the cook and the hitchhiker. Um, uh, cook, uh, Jim Seedow, who is amazing in this role. Yeah. Um, he is kind of the main subterfuge of the story though. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, in rewatching it, the thing that I think I, I got this time in watching it was when the kids first come to the gas station, which he he's in charge of, he tells them to go home. Yeah, he, he tells them, you know, yeah. those girls don't want to go playing around in that house. You guys don't want to be doing this. Yeah, like he's telling them, like, yeah, just just keep on going. He's trying to give them an out and, and yeah. don't take it. And you almost because of that, when Sally runs away from the house the first time and she comes to him, mm-hmm. he seems like he's going to help her. Like he's going to try and get her to yeah. safety. And yeah. it, it's hard to remember the first time I saw it to see if uh, I was as conned. But uh, the the idea of his nature flipping like that once he brings mm-hmm. her to the car and puts the sack in her and he's stabbing her with the, the stick. The birds, yeah. <laughs> That's just the most messed up scene to me in the movie. <laughs> I, I, I don't know why I laugh every time he pulls out that broom and just like <laughs> just swatting at her with a broom. It's just like of all the weapons right, they right. could be using. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just like he just flips on a dime. It's just like yeah. it goes from get out of here, just go on home. You don't want to take the girls don't want to be playing around in that dirty old house. Like, yeah. you know, and. Uh, that he kind of does do a little bit of, you know, you can sit here and wait until the gas truck arrives because they're trying to get gas. And he says he doesn't have any gas. He's waiting for the tanker to arrive. So it is kind of like you can stay here, you know, and kind of do and wait on the truck. It's like maybe another out or maybe another lure. You're not really sure. Um, But yeah, he does go from kind of like, oh, get out of here to like when she comes back, it's, you know, it's everything's out the window at that point. (laughs) You almost it's it's so funny when you watch that sequence. And this is his acting. It's all in his face. Mm-hmm. How he goes back and forth between, are you okay? Are you okay down there? Are you going to be okay? Are you okay? Mm-hmm. Oh, and then oh. he starts laughing. <laughs> yeah, <he's> like, <laughs> it's a, you know, you can't help but notice that there's humor in this movie. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. so demented. You got to laugh, you know? Um, and then so, uh, and and I love that he comes back for the sequel. And I love his, his character even more in part two, I think. Um, which will be another episode one day. But we'll yeah. get um, and you're welcome to come back if you'd like. Oh, yeah. But um, the other character that I want to talk about is the hitchhiker. Yes. Uh, Ed Neal plays the hitchhiker. Yeah, yeah. And um, he is a like a slapstick comedian. Mm-hmm. So this is just a wonderful role of him just getting to be so out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, I just remember, is it, um, I cannot remember the gentleman in the wheelchair's name right offhand. I don't know why. Pertain, uh, uh, the... Uh, um, Paul Pertain plays uh, Franklin. Franklin, yeah. Franklin, Franklin, when he gets in, he says, we just picked up Dracula. (laughs) I love that. That's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and Franklin's another character who, like, uh, I was just rewatching today the the documentary about the movie, and uh, they talk about how 
Paul Bertain didn't know how to go back and forth between playing characters because he was a new yeah. actor. He was yeah. Franklin all the time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the the Gunnar Hansen book, he was just like, yeah, it was really annoying. <laughs> that it, I think there were some people that kind of blew up on him on set. They're yes. just like, stop doing this. <laughs> and it kind of, uh, in listening to the documentary, they were talking also about how it kind of almost made the dynamic of the actors the same as the, the dynamic you see in the movie oh yeah yeah they were just completely sick and tired of him before the movie even gets started yeah. <laughs> but uh and, and uh marilyn burns talks about how it's just like uh, you you just wanted to hit him you know yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's it's to the point where it was so so convincing that once they get to the point that franklin is murdered you're just like yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help every time I wa watch this film I can't help but wonder who thought it was a good idea to take him on this trip in the first place this is like yeah. <laughs> this is long before OSHA regulations there yeah. is no ramp anywhere for a wheelchair and this yeah. poor kid you know like <laughs> it's like even the the weird makeshift wooden ramps that they put yeah. on the van for him to get in and out you're just like oh my god <laughs> yeah it, it, it's all a bad idea you know yeah um, the um uh, one of the things I wanted to, to mention, we were talking a little bit about the cook and we were talking about the scene at the gas station is um, this is one of those films that as you rewatch it, there's more layers to it than mm -hmm. what you get the first time. And um, knowing that the kids buy a bucket of uh, barbecue. Yeah. You can't help but wonder what they were chomping on. You oh, know? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See it where Franklin sitting there in his wheelchair playing with his knife and it's got mm -hmm. like a a hunk of meat sticking out of his mouth and you're like I wonder what that is yeah. you know? <laughs> and they kind of allude to it too when she goes back and yes. the cook goes like, out to get the there. truck and there's like there's a pit there and there's stuff roasting in there and she just, yeah. they just kind of pan to that and so you're just like oh <laughs> yeah. it's like that doesn't look like stuff I'm used to seeing you know that, that's not yeah. like a duck this isn't a Chinese yeah. restaurant got it you know <laughs> but uh just still that there's so much that, that because the characters and the actors how they, they got into their roles so well mm -hmm. and everything around them I think helped that kind of even if it's because they're amateurs but this kind of method acting worked so much better because of the environments they were put in mm -hmm. and the set dressing and, and all of the costuming and all those types of things working together um, one last thing I wanted to discuss uh, about something that's like an important staple about this film is um, and this is something that that's pretty heavy in my own research, uh, is, uh, you know, there, there's the final girl theory. Yes. Um, you can't help but talk about anything that's in the slasher realm without discussing the final girl. And, mm -hmm. um, I think if you look back to Carol Clover's, uh, original book, uh, Men, Women, and Chainsaw, Sally really is the, the first person that she defines as yeah. the final girl. Yeah. Uh, what do you, what, how do you feel about the character of Sally? I, I kind of feel the same way, uh, uh, too, that, uh, I don't know, to me, it's just so iconic, you know, because you have a group, uh, three men, two women, and, you know, obviously Franklin is in a wheelchair, so there's, you know, going to be limitations with him, um, but you're also just like, everybody else is able-bodied um, yes. to, to move around and stuff, and I don't know, in your mind, like, I think the first time I saw it, it's just like, that's not who I had in my head yes. uh, that was going to uh, make it through the entire thing. So it kind of like, yeah, it kind of is a bit of a change compared to like most slasher films. And I do feel like, sh to me, she's the most iconic final girl to me. Um, but it's just like, yeah, it's that because I can't really recall right now, uh, you know, yeah, usually that final person is worn down beat up ripped up you know kind of bloody and stuff but it's just like her she's just like covered head to toe yes. her d clothes are destroyed uh yes. she has like a head wound that's bleeding from where they hit her in the head with the hammer and stuff um and she actually did i think mess up her ankle or knee or yep. something but she jumped out the window so she was limping that limp was real when she yep. was running Definitely. Uh, down that driveway towards the semi truck so um it's just like yeah it just it's such a icon and then her scream yes. her scream is just so like raw and very very real and stuff and it's just like it's it just sticks in your head so much to be like yeah this girl fought <laughs> tooth and nail to get away from this so yeah there's um 
if you compare kind of Texas Chainsaw to maybe some of the more like the 80s slashers and Mm -hmm. kind of the advent of the Scream Queen and all that kind of thing, Mm -hmm. there's something so different in the way Marilyn Burns screams. Yes. That say, I don't know, like a Linnea Quigley or somebody screams where it's Mm -hmm. this kind of, she, it feels like she's in pain and agony. And yeah, yeah. You feel for her, you know? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, her act of screaming just reinforces her fight through the whole thing. She doesn't yeah. stop struggling from the minute she's in the thick of it, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think that's a, a really positive nature about Sally is that she's constantly pushing. She's con- She doesn't let them just, you know, have their way. She is going to get out of this and she's going to do it. She's going to figure yes. it out. Uh, yeah. I'm not so sure what state her brain is in by the end of it. But, um, you know, even if she's walking away, you know, in tatters, you know, mm-hmm. she's going to make sure she gets out of there. And yeah. Yeah. That's very strong from the start. Yeah. Yeah. And and like uh, like I said, too, with her scream, too, it's just like, I don't know if there's so much screaming going on when the filming and stuff that it, her voice almost sounds like it's raw. Yes. Like, it, it sounds like she's on the verge of losing her voice. She's been screaming so much, which, I right. mean, is adds to the realism of the film yeah. and stuff. And But, like, I don't recall, like, another you know, final girl screaming that way. It was just like, it's just bloody murder <laughs> screaming. Uh, yes. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, and uh, probably exhaustion and everything else added to that. But yeah. Uh, it's definitely, uh, you can tell it's taking its toll, but yeah. it's it's partially in character and partially, you know, her life at that moment, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and um, I really appreciate the fact that, um, whereas, I, to go back to the slasher concept, I think this is a film that leads up to a slasher. I don't think this is a slasher. Yeah. Uh, it has elements that would later become slashers, but I don't think we can say slashers begin till Halloween in 78. Yeah, yeah, I would think, yeah, it seemed like uh, closer to the 80s it was mm-hmm. when it really, really boomed. And that was just, yeah, you know, you just had your evil person just... Yeah, like literally slashing. You had Freddy Krueger with the knives slashing, you know, Michael Myers, uh, uh, the machete for Jason and stuff like that. So it was like an actual knife slashing. Um, But like with this, it's like it's a chainsaw. It's just like this instrument that is loud that you can't just carry around and sneak up on somebody with. You're like, they know you're coming, you know, it's just like nobody else. It's like they just sneak up, you know, slash you, you're done. Or this one, it's just like there's a that noise, that sound is kind of like is a warning you for what's about to come. So Yeah, definitely. And I think the if anything, maybe what comes from from slashers from this is the kind of the group dynamic. And yes. um, maybe I, I could see where the final girl could have started. You know, Sally is a final girl and that could kind of you can see how that evolves through other films. But um yeah, even the way that the other teens are, I mean you know you, you know for part of it that some of them at least are going to be fodder, but the, yeah. uh, it is a, a, a definitely a switch where mm-hmm. you would have thought like Kirk or one of the other guys would have, would have been the ones to kind of walk away. Yeah. She was the, on, the only one with this kind of the strength to get past it. So mm-hmm. I find that impressive uh, from that time period. Totally. Yeah. Um, one thing we probably should talk about uh, in the history of Chainsaw is their financial woes. Mm-hmm. Kind of like um, much like, what we spoke about with Night of Living Dead, uh, independent film. This is something where they kept running out of money, so they kept kind of, they, they called it selling out shares in the film, and then two or three layers deep into distributors, so they, they lost more than what they owned. And of course, uh, notoriously, the, the the distributors who got the movie out there were mob-based, so that wasn't yeah. great for anybody's business sense. Yeah. But uh unlike most independent films this was actually really successful almost right off the bat so Mm -hmm. that is something like really important about this film was it made a a dent in kind of uh the public consciousness really quickly um because it was so different than anything else Mm -hmm. um but unfortunately you know none of the people involved in making the film made that money at that time which is uh which is sad and that's kind of the story of independent filmmaking sometimes yeah 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 that's true especially if you make a successful film mm-hmm. you definitely don't make any money back so unfortunately that's the truth yeah. um but you know that's part of the history um let's talk a little bit about ways uh people can own or watch texas chainsaw um what version of the the movie do you have 
I have, I'm going to hold this up. I have, it's a 40th anniversary um, Blu-ray disc. Uh, it has the all do 4K digital restoration. I got this. There's a, I don't know if you got a glare on there a little bit. I got this. At, there's a place, place a few um, blocks for me called Second Time Around. It sells a lot of used and stuff. And I go through there and just sort through a lot. And I picked it up. And like I told you, um, you said, uh, asked if it had any, um, extra features. It, it does have like commentaries yeah. on it, um, but it doesn't have like a second disc of extra features. It's just a single disc. Yeah, this this version that I got, yeah, this one's kind of hard to see. Uh, yeah. there, um, this one's kind of the two disc version of that same disc. Yeah. So I think this is like the special limited edition that I guess I was lucky to get. Yeah. <laughs> the, the weird thing about it, and this is kind of early in Blu-ray lifespan too, was that um, it's uh, 2014 this came out so it's two discs the the movie the blu-ray with the commentary tracks and mm. the nice restoration and then the second disc is completely packed with extras and then there's a dvd that's supposed to be the same of both which is i, d I never understood that i have some that have a blu-ray and a dvd and i don't quite understand that concept <laughs> I get it because sometimes it pays off because I don't, you know, I only have one Blu-ray player, but I do have multiple DVD players. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Sometimes I'll take a DVD with me as a portable, but um, I just thought it was strange that the extras were included on the DVD, which is weird. Yeah. But, um, the things that make this up, part of what makes the special edition special is is the, the it was for a while the only way to get this, which is long oh, out of print. Yeah. Family Portrait um, is... Uh, excellent documentary um mm -hmm. this is probably uh of the documentaries out there they're about one film this is mm -hmm. probably one of the best out there um this is up there with like document of the dead about the making of dawn of the dead yeah. i highly recommend this even if you can't find this version you should find a way to watch this and i believe that is streaming on amazon i, I if i remember correctly I, I i would have to look it up again but i, I there are was, portions yeah. of it on youtube but i know it's not the entirety so yeah yeah. That would be the way to go then. Um, to talk a little bit about, um, let's see, let's go back a little bit. Um, DVDs, since we're, that's a DVD. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the DVD that I had back in the day. Um, yeah, that's one, the one I had. Yeah. yeah, It's the Pioneer Special Edition, which is the commentary tracks. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has small interviews, but it didn't have like a great, like, I went and bought this because this didn't have as much as I kind of wanted on the extras. Yeah. Um, but it's a, still, you know, it was a great way to get the movie at the time. There was a special edition that came out later. This one's mm -hmm. really hard to see. But the um, all of these are owned by Pioneer, by the way. I'll put Is up that, oh, yeah, I haven't seen that one. I did have one. I don't recall. I'd have to get out of frame to go look. Um, but I used to have a, a DVD that was like, it was like gold medal. Oh. And, like you would open it up and yeah I think when I went to the when I got this thing uh, there was a lot of times when I have doubles I'll ask friends have you ever do you ha own a copy of this and I I tend to give people copies of things when I end up getting doubles yeah. and stuff so I believe I may have gotten rid of it but yeah I had one that was like a gold metal you opened up it was real heavy almost like a lunchbox material it was oh crazy. like the steel book okay. yeah yeah That's and I, I believe I may have given that away, but yeah, because yeah, as soon as I got the 4K, because we have a 4K television and Blu-ray and stuff, so I was like, okay, well. <laughs> great. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, we kept our, deep, my, this was my husband's and this one was mine. Mm -hmm. We kept these because they were already autographed. Signed, yeah, that's yeah, cool. So, uh, and I do have, of course, when I talk about a classic movie that I really, really love, I have a laser disc. Oh, by pretty much everyone who's uh, who was alive at one point when I met them, um, who worked on this film. So this yeah. is, is pretty. It's very awesome. It's, it's um, I, years it. ago. I had a, a laser disc that my uncle had given me. That is cool. Um, <laughs> that was uh, my uncle had given me a laser disc, and he gave me like uh, he had Pink Floyd, The Wall, and Tommy, and, like, oh, all wow. of these really great, like, yeah, musical, uh, and I wish I would have kept that thing, because, like, yeah, some of those were really great on that, but it was, like, before, anybody who doesn't know, before DVD, there was yeah. those things, like, a <laughs> size of an LP. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I always love getting my lasers uh, signed, because 
yeah. it's the difference between getting a CD signed when you meet a band versus getting a record signed, right? You oh, know, yeah, yeah. All this space, you can get all these people signed on it. Um, but this is when I got my Laserdisc player. The kind of the thing then was the Elite Entertainment editions. Oh yeah. The yeah. specials, you know, like the the best ones out there were Elite Entertainment. They were four disc, uh, you know, two to four disc per, and they mm -hmm. eightfold editions. And this has excellent stuff on it. I mean. Uh, one of the things that's different, and we were talking about sound design, is they have the uh, the isolated analog tracks, which is really oh. cool. Uh -huh. There's uh, audio commentaries, uh, deleted scenes, which are the same deleted scenes that you see later, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, you know your trailers and your stills. But just it's just it's massive, and that's pretty cool about it. Yeah, it's, really cool. Yeah, it's it's really wonderful. I love the the family photo on the back too. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so. As always, my laser disc. Um, let's go back to the Blu-ray so I can talk about what's awesome about this Blu-ray and why I recommend it. Um, the one you have is essentially the same set. So, yeah. um, how, what, do you, what did you think of the the transfer? The this. The I thought it was really good. I mean, we just bought our um, 4K television within like the past year, mm -hmm. uh, and that's why I said I, I upgraded to the the Blu-ray, the 4K, and stuff. Um, the day scenes seemed really super crisp and mm. it was so weird. I remember like listening to somebody talk about um, uh, Sally's shirt being purple and I'm like, it's, it's blue. Like in my head it was blue. And then when I watched this last night, I was like, her shirt is purple. I was just like, it was <laughs> insane. Crazy. I was just like, okay. Um, I didn't see like, um, I mean, I, I like grainy, you know, yeah. like I like, I, it was shot. 16 millimeter correct I believe so yeah I think yeah so whoops uh so I actually prefer um like the grainy I, I don't know I'm just old no, school it, stuff VHS and stuff I get like that. that it's yeah. uh the more they clean this movie up and every time I, I get a new version where they cleaned it up even more or even that 4k screening I went to it's so strange to me that you can see everything now you know it's like yeah so much of it um and it's a movie where kind of like historically people always walk around walk out thinking that they saw more blood than they actually did yeah but when yeah, you hear Cindy hooper talk about it they were trying yeah. to put a lot of blood but you couldn't see it because so yeah yeah because uh, they always the the one famous thing is people say when they put the girl up on the hook yeah, that you, you actually see it. see it and it's like no you don't see it it's you don't see anything you don't even see any blood or anything you just no, see her no. on that hook holding on like whimpering you know yeah. but that, that's it and it's just like but yeah it was amazing like s certain detail that I just like never noticed before it's like oh yeah that's a lot clearer and stuff yeah. like that so it's like yeah there's it's a lot clearer but it does have that grainy kind of the speckled I always call it like the speckle black specks or whatever from the 16 yeah. millimeter on it but uh, well, yeah it seemed fairly crisp crisp in the the daylight yeah. scenes yeah, yeah. And you can tell um especially in the evening like the the outdoor night scenes it still has that graininess because it's like you know they're using as little light as possible so the 16 yeah. millimeter is going to grain out for that mm -hmm. but the more they clean it up you can see blood now Mm -hmm. In the scene, like the scene where, where uh, uh, Leatherface kills uh, Paul Portain's character when he kills yeah. Frank, mm -hmm. you can see blood where for years of watching this movie on video... You couldn't see something. anything. Yeah. It, was, it looked like mud. It didn't look mm -hmm. like... Right? Yeah. So it's definitely... Um, the cleaned up version takes you a minute to get used to when you're used to the kind of the grainy ones. There's certain yeah. movies where you kind of want the VHS grain, but mm -hmm. it's it's cool that they can restore it so that the film yeah. will last, you know? Um just to go over quickly some of the great things on this extra disc. So the documentary that I mentioned before, uh, this is on here. Mm -hmm. And extras for this are on here as well. So um, there's outtakes from making this that appear on this disc you wouldn't have seen before, okay. which is pretty cool. Uh, there's also um, another documentary. That, so that's a full-length documentary. There's another one called Flesh Wounds, uh, which is by Red Shirt Productions. And you guys know that most of the um, Blu-rays that came out from shock treatment uh, i'm sorry from uh ah shock factory yeah the shock factory <laughs> ones uh they use a lot of uh, the red shirt editions so um this is a red shirt dark sky production mm -hmm. um so it's another full length feature talking about the making of the film with the people who made the movie actors uh everyone behind the scenes you could get um there's uh also, actually, in the flesh wounds, there's talking to people who are fans, which is interesting. Oh. There's the head of the fan club. 
uh, at the house from the movie the interview takes place so that's interesting and then they also talk to people who worked for like cinema wasteland oh. and some of the other um horror conventions about the importance of that so that's mm-hmm. that's really cool too there's a tour of the house by Gunnar hansen which is very cool wow yeah that is on youtube but it's mm-hmm. great to see it on here interviews with the production managers uh, the actress, Terry McMinn, who was the girl who was put on the meat hook. So that's cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have uh, deleted scenes. Uh, you have a, a really candid conversation with uh, John Dugan about playing grandpa. Uh, you have the person who was the special effects guy who's a doctor who was hired to make the makeup for him, talking about how he made grandpa's makeup. Mm-hmm. The editor, there's bloopers, uh, there's... Horror Hallowed Grounds does a uh, site visit now of all the locations you can visit. So this is a really thorough Blu-ray. I think this is definitely, if you're going to look for a version, if you can find this, this is the way to go. I highly recommend it. It's the Dark Sky Films 40th Anniversary two-part collector edition. So highly recommend if you're going to collect it. That's the way. And just really quick, want to show off a couple of toys. Um, Got my little... Oh, oh. Oh. (laughs) But uh, also, I think, and this, if you're going to collect a toy, our toys, you got to go back to the Tom McFarlane age. Yeah, yeah. Old Leatherface mm-hmm. movie Maniacs edition. This is one of the first ones that they did, and it's just such great quality. Yeah. You can get a little bucket full of guys and stuff. Oh, that's cool. So, <laughs> there's so much great stuff out there because people are such diehard fans of this film, and mm-hmm. people find all kinds of ways to commemorate this film and it's it's amazing i know i have lots of fan art in my house as well mm-hmm. um and what other kind of stuff do you have CD? uh yeah i have a by the door <laughs> that's always the first thing that people come in they see i have a huge uh, movie poster that's just uh you know texas chainsaw massacre it's black and white with the red lettering for the texas chainsaw massacre and it has the tagline of who will survive and what will be left of them yep. and then uh, i have the they call it the pretty lady, so it's the dinner scene table. I have a mask, because uh, actually, this year, uh, me and my partner were planning on dressing up. I would be Leatherface, and oh. he is going to be Sally. He is going to be the final girl. So <laughs> I bought, yeah, I need that mask. That. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I have my pinstriped shirt and I have the tie with the the blue tie with the little blue loops on it I still need to get boots cowboy boots and uh, a dark navy blue suit uh, and we haven't started on his either but uh, at, um, but I'm just like oh well it's just white bell bottoms you know that now purple because I always purple thought shirt. it was yep. <laughs> yeah I always thought it was light blue but it's like a lavender tank top yeah. with the and uh, yeah the, the blonde wig and stuff so he'll be dressing up as Sally so <laughs> I, I look forward to seeing that on your yeah. Twitter feed one day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ironically, um, uh, knowing when we're taping this is uh, during uh, the the whole world being on quarantine. Um, yeah. <laughs> why we have the time to do things like this right now? Mm-hmm. But uh, ironically, next week was supposed to be spring break, um, and we we had we had been planning on going to Texas to yeah. stay at the barbecue. Um, the 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 gas station they call yeah. it gas station yeah. but yeah we were actually that's the irony of when you yeah. said oh, let's do texas chainsaw and i'm like we're watching yeah. it on. we were going to be re- watching this yeah. anyway now because we were supposed to be getting ready for this trip but one day i will get to texas yeah Hopefully not we, <laughs> we've been planning on it for like two years in a row and things just haven't worked out but yeah there's the there's the gas station that is like a bed and breakfast i think yep. also um, the house is now a barbecue restaurant and it has, um, little cabins. It's like set near a lake cause they actually moved the house. The house is um, moved twice. Yeah. It's yeah. really strange. Yeah. Yeah. It's like near a lake now and they have like little cabins and, uh, like, um, cabooses that they've turned into like little cabins. Like you can yeah. actually like stay. It's like a, I don't, what am I thinking of? Like a park, park grounds or it's something like, like that. A, um, from the research I've been doing, it's part of a country club. But yeah, it's, yeah, but it's a historic uh, spot. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's like a, something train uh, influence, and train it's and, yeah. yeah they, so they have the 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 house is the restaurant mm-hmm. that you can, but then you can like you could literally stay in a bed and breakfast looking at the restaurant. All yeah, day, yeah. Which is and then um, the cemetery at the beginning 
yes. is in Austin. So like if basically if you fly in or drive in or whatever to Austin, I think it's like an hour in one direction to go yep. to the gas station and it's an hour in the other direction to go to uh, the house. The house. And then the graveyard's then, in the middle. Yeah, and the graveyard's like in the middle, a little bit yeah. north of uh, Austin. Yeah. Yeah, it's like I think it's a 40 minute drive. Like from here's Austin, air, like the airport by Austin. And then it's like 40 minutes this way, 40 minutes that way to get to each. And then in the middle, you can stop at the graveyard on the way. Yeah, we had it all planned out, too. Yeah. <laughs> like and, you go, and, I think in I the think... summertime, time, the, bar, uh, the gas station has, well, they have cabins. Yeah. And then they, they also do, like, events in the summer, which. Yeah, because is... it was, like, last Halloween or something. I think a couple of the actors actually were at the gas station for, yeah. like, one day or something like that. They had an advertisement I saw uh, online, actually, in February. They're having their own convention there. Oh, wow. And there's all kinds of people lined up. I think Bill Mosley's going to be there um, oh. and cool people like that. So, um, and Carolyn Williams from the the, mm -hmm. the sequel. So, um, yeah, I would love. Yeah, there. I would definitely look into that. Yeah. yeah. And then also, I think it's private property, but I think you can kind of drive past and take photos of the house that they went into. Like it was supposed to be like Franklin's grandfather's house yeah, or something yeah. like that. Yeah, the rundown house, but apparently it's kind of like up on a hill, and I think you can stop into the driveway and take like a photo of it. But they ask you not to go on the property because it it belongs to somebody, and they don't want people messing around up there. So that's fair. Yeah, yeah. but that's pretty cool. It, yeah, it's it's definitely a movie where even though things might not be where they were when they made it, everything's still there. So mm -hmm. it's one of those. Yeah, it's on my to do list of getting yeah. this while it's still <laughs> yeah. possible. Yeah, but. Uh, I think that sums us up for Texas Chainsaw. Is there anything we forgot to talk about? Um, I can't think of anything right off the top of my head right now. Then um, how about, why don't you tell everybody um, how they can find your books and Grindhouse online? Okay. Um, well, uh, if I'm on Twitter at, at CV Hunt. Um, if you want to check out any of my stuff, I'm personal stuff and whatever there. But, um, yeah, you can go Barnes & Noble, Amazon, um, and just search CV Hunt. My books will pop up. Uh, if you're interested in Grindhouse, there's grindhousepress.com, or you can search at Grindhouse Press on Twitter and Facebook. Um, yeah, and on the website, I keep it updated. Um, there, if you just go to like announcements or whatever, anything new that comes up goes goes there. Uh, if you click on books, it has all of our books. You can search all of those on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, anywhere you buy books, it'll be on there. And um, a good majority of them are starting to become audiobooks too. So if anybody's interested in those, uh, eBooks and audiobooks are available. Very cool. Uh, I highly recommend. Like I said, uh, Halloween Fiend. I just finished. And I'm just starting. I got. Oh, sorry. Um, so Halloween Fiend. I just finished. Uh, we had last year. I got the Misery of Death and other yeah. things. The um, uh, I met you couple times now at scares mm -hmm. the care convention so if you're a scares yeah. the care person you can go right to the grindhouse table and buy mm -hmm. directly from the authors which is very cool and then uh, next i'll be reading this one <laughs> <laughs> but uh thanks so much for uh doing this with me and uh skyping as a, a guest on the show I yeah really and thanks for having me on i enjoy uh anybody wants to talk to me about texas chainsaw massacre i'll go on for days <laughs> <laughs> if anybody wants a sequel to this episode we could always do more <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> thanks again cv okay thank you The Weird and Wacky Fiction Podcast with me, your host, Mr. Frank. Every Monday, we're talking to everyone who's anyone writing weird and wacky fiction. So if you enjoy reading funny and strange books or you enjoy writing funny and strange books, join us on Bazong each week to learn along with Mr. Frank. Bazong every Monday, a part of the Project Entertainment Network. Bazong! 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 This has been a presentation of the Project Entertainment Network.